this computer. All right, guys, welcome back to the Pro Physique Code. We have our regular guest on, Dr. Bill Campbell from the University of South Florida. How are you, Bill? I'm good. I'm real good. How are you? I'm really good. This is the end of the year. I feel like it should be a little more relaxed. It doesn't feel like the holidays to me. Me and Misty keep talking about, like, you know, we've got to make more of an effort to get the the, the house. You know, we've got it decorated, but it just doesn't feel like the holidays. Is that is that feel like that for you or is that just because it's us? Um, I think that's that's also for me. But in all honesty, my, my my wife will do all of the decorating and the like she I, if, if if it were up to me, I wouldn't even I don't even know if I'd get a tree. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get a tree tonight. That's a big one. Getting the big tree when you have little kids like we have, you know, that 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 makes Christmas fun. Um, yeah, so we're going to go do all that. But um, I wanted to jump on and talk about. Um, so l- let's talk about your publication first, the the body by science. Um, where can people find this and, and how can they get it? Okay, so it's very simple to find. It's at my website, and my website is BillCampbellPhD.com. And every month it comes out uh, the middle of the month, so typically like the 15th of every month. And I summarize two research articles that are, they're either very recent or they're the classic studies that have informed the way we coach our physique athletes and again, they're just the the landmark studies. Yeah, uh, it is six ninety nine. the The price will increase, I believe, starting at the the new year. So if anybody does buy now, you're kind of locking into a price that that won't that won't be this low again. Um, and I would say, if I didn't already make this clear, it's it's solely focused on building muscle and losing fat. So I don't really deviate from that formula. So if if that's if you're working with clients. And their goals are weight loss or trying to to shape their body. I don't think there's going to be yeah. a more relevant research review or application based research review. And then, um, as we talked before, I bring in experts like you to help apply the findings. So you also get expert level application or ideas on how you would take the research and work with your clients based on those findings. Yeah. And so you've had name some of the people you've had, because you obviously had me and Lauren on the first one, but I saw people like, I think I saw Lauren Bear. Uh, who else have you had do some reviews? Um, Gabri- Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, um, Mike Matthews, um, Kurt Rollins, um, who, uh, Brett Contreras coming up. Um, boy. Let me guess oh, what hey, Brett's hey, talking hey, about. What's that? Let me guess what study Brett's talking about. <laughs> yeah, guess. I actually reached out to him. Of course, it's a glute study. And I said, hey, give me some recommendations um, of people that, and he's like, oh, I want to do it. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, I mean, that's so why passionate. I love Brett. Brett is, yeah. he has not, he has not veered off of his focus in a, over a decade now, you know? So it's, it's, yeah. Um, although it was very in vogue for a while for people to start talking about glute training, he, he wasn't doing it because it was in vogue. He was doing it before it was in vogue. So um, I'm actually, so I'm actually going to be staying with Brett for an entire week um, in Vegas yes. uh, for, the, for the Olympia. So he's, he's excited. I haven't been to, to Vegas since um, 2020 happened. Right. So I haven't, you know, I used to go out there maybe three, four times a year for the shows and it's been, you know, more than two years. So it'll be, it'll be good to get out there and, you know, visit brett's always a good time to hang out with as well um steven's gonna stay with us too stephen bogrant so you should have him do a review uh he'd be a good one um so this this study is interesting to me so we're going to talk about um the study of training a muscle either two or three times a week right so stimulating uh getting some some sessions in with a muscle multiple times per week and you and i grew up in the era of you trained your legs one day a week. You, you weren't able to walk out of the gym. You were sore for three or four days and you came back a week later and trained and you did that with your chest, your back. I mean, I remember literally training until I couldn't touch my elbows. That was my, like when I did chest day, if I could touch my elbows, I went back and trained more. I had to, <laughs> I did be so, so, and I likewise, I would do the same thing with back day. I'd be like, if I can do a pull up, I can do more. Right. So, yep. and then I think a lot of evidence came out um, that that Lane Norton turned me on to. He was the first person that when I first started working with him, he's like, hey, we're going to train everything twice a week. And I was like, 
this is genius. I'll, I'll train back and chest together one day. I'm going to train, you know, it, it was just a very clever split. It was his power hypertrophy split. Um, because I was training heavy. I was training with hypertrophy. I was training with, um, multiple days per week. And it was like the first time you train in the gym, the first six months that just nonstop progress. And I felt like that start that happened again. And of course I was eating right. And I was, you know, training with this new philosophy. So I'm curious to see where this research goes. So if you, if you want to just like talk about this study, how old it is and you know, who ran it and all that stuff. Yeah. So in, in, in this particular study, they compared two versus three days. Now that's not suggesting that two or three is the best. That's just what they happen to compare in this study. This study was, it was published in 2019 and it's one of the most, if not the most recent study to look at this area of how many times per week. So I'll st let me start with, as I introduced the study, um, where you started. Traditionally, bodybuilders would, would, they would train chest Monday, back Tuesday, legs Thursday, shoulders Friday, you know, one body part every week. So six or seven days per week, each body part got stimulated one time. Since we started researching this and almost all of this research that has that has challenged that has been done in the last 10 years. And I would say, or when I'm asked the question and when I present this at a conference, we don't know the ideal training frequency. What we do know is one time a week is suboptimal. Two is better than one. Three is better than one. Four is better than one. But is four better than two? Is three better than four? Though that's still, I don't think anybody in in the evidence based fitness realm would 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 be confident in saying this is what we we know that this is better. Other than what I just said, so more than once per week. This particular study compared two versus three days per week. And let me just look at the subjects. I think they were resistance train subjects. Yes. So resistance I mean, to handle, training. To handle that much volume, you you couldn't really put new people on two or three days. That'd be a lot for a new person, right? Yeah. Yeah. Especially. Yeah. Um, depending on what yeah, the split. So I I would. Yeah. Well, if they're if they've never lifted before. Yeah. I start with one day per week. <laughs> Otherwise, you're yeah, asking. I'll start with like two days per week, full body, even sometimes like very, you know, low volume. Yes. Yeah. So what they, what they did with the, um, the two versus three days per week, they, they did a lower upper, um, for the, for the two days per week. And then the three day per week was full body. So three days per week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then the other one was, I'm sorry, three, two days per week, split body. Um, they did a lower upper split. So lower upper was the two days and then the full body three days per week. Okay. And volume was the same. So we have to we have to start there. That wasn't like because they trained three a muscle group three days per week that that was um, that they did more volume. So volume was the same. And they also controlled for intensity, which is also very important, making sure so that they just, just in case someone listening isn't familiar with volume, you want to just explain that? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I have it like I, I made a whole table here. So let's say somebody's training their their chest. Um, let's just use the chest as an example. So if they train it two days per week or three days per week, if the three days per week does five sets every day, that's 15 total sets. And if they only trained it for five sets on the two days per week, well, now that's only 10 total sets. So you would have 15 total sets versus only 10. And if you did a study like that at the end of the study, if one group did better, let's say the three group did better, was it because they trained it three times or because they did five more sets per week? You don't know. Perfect. So essentially what we did, what they did in this study was the, the it was like a 12 sets per week and they would hit the chest on four sets three times per week or six sets twice per week. So regardless okay. whether it was three or two days per week of stimulating the chest, it was a total of 12 working sets. And did they have, they had obviously a 24 hour period of resting between workouts at least? 
Those yes. Are, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. There was never a back to yeah. Never a back to back day. Yep. Yeah. So there. Yeah. Recovery was accounted for the, in this as well. Um, the researchers did this again, and they measured three different muscle groups. They did the arms, so the biceps and the triceps, and then the quadriceps. So again, this was a muscle hypertrophy study, and they said, what, "Is one of these better than the other?" Versus, you know, stimulating the muscle group either two days per week or three days per week, same volume, same intensity. And I mean, one obvious difference is the three day per week um, program was little, I'll just say like 45 minutes per workout when they were only training twice per week. Now you're looking at probably like an hour, an hour and 15 per workout. Sure. Um, so let's just go to the go to the end. Um, there were no statistically significant differences in muscle hypertrophy. Both groups gained a significant amount of muscle mass in all three muscle groups, the biceps, the triceps and the quadriceps. But and unfortunately, I don't have the picture to show you. If you look at the data, it does appear that twice per week. Well, it doesn't look like they did perform better. They gain more muscle mass with twice per week than they did with three times per week. It just did not reach the level of statistical significance. Now, that was actually surprising to me because other research actually has, you know, the, the opposite finding. Um, three, three days was a little bit better than two days. In this case, two was a little bit better than three. So you have to interpret this study in light of what we know. Um, the totality of the evidence and it kind of just made things more complicated because we don't know. Again, going back to what we do know, one day is not ideal. There's not one study that I'm aware of in non-enhanced athletes where training your chest one day per week is better than splitting that volume up over two through five or six days per week. Sure. Um, and, and I'll just add to the conversation I've, I've done six days per week. I've done whole body six days per week in the last couple of years that I've done that kind of a split. And I really like that. I mean, I've got reasons to think that's a great idea. Sure. Um, so, and, and when you said you made your switch, it was from one to two days per week. Yeah. Mine would have been a primarily like a bro split where it was either like, uh, you know, a push pull legs day off an arm day, and then a couple of days off and start over, or it would have been, um, just like an all out back an all out chest. Um, and what I always found, you know, odd about those training splits is you are actually stimulating some muscle groups more than once a week, even though you're not trying to. So like you're, if you're doing a chest day and a shoulder day, your shoulders are getting a lot more volume than just your chest is right. And, yep. and likewise, um, with back, you know, you're also hitting your shoulders again, the rear delts are in a, in engaged in a lot of the pulling movements. So, and biceps you know, and back. Yeah. And I heard a lot of people would say like, Oh, like my, my physique isn't developing properly. I'm overpowering shoulders. I'm like, well, like you're training them with more frequency. You think you're training them the same, but it, you know, you cannot really chain the chest without at least engaging the shoulders some. So um, there was probably evidence already that there were superior training protocols you know, I work with Brett Contreras closely on designing training programs for my women, and he loves training glutes three days a week. Um, the key is he is, you know, he and I talk about is you can't murder somebody and expect them to train again effectively in a few days. Right. So, you know, we, we basically pick like one major movement and kind of one accessory movement per glute workout, but I have found that to be a great strategy for building. So I wonder if there is a difference in muscle groups, because I think the quadriceps are going to be a little bit more resilient than the biceps, right? So, you know, that study you mentioned, it was the biceps, the triceps and the quads, you know, I'd, I'd be interested to see if the quads could handle more frequency because, you know, Dr. Zordos was doing the squat to a max every day for a while. Um, I think, you know, most of us have all tried those squeeze, crazy squat programs where we, you know, four days a week, five days a week, we're squatting pretty heavy. Um, and I respond very well to those for a while, but then you're talking about, okay, now you're just got to overcome your biomechanics. Um, you know, a squat has so much to it. It's not just a quadricep by any means. It's a whole body exercise. Um, so those squat programs, I don't know, you ever do any of those, the small ofs or the, um, 
not I've never done <laughs> small love. I've done um I've I've done a program in one of my studies actually where it was I think it was three versus six days per week, same volume. Um, and I was in my 30s then, probably late 30s. My knees were yeah. Was that eighth week of I remember that study, I think it was eight weeks long. I was not in a good place in that eighth week, squatting that many times. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just found out, I mean, I guess you find out your weaknesses sooner, but I'm just not biomechanically a great squatter. So I learned, okay, I can't do that. But there are some movements that I'm very good at that I am that I can do with high frequency and not get hurt. Um, and as a coach, that's now what I look for in videos when I see somebody, when I see somebody squat down and they look like a spark plug and they go right back up. I'm like, man, this person can handle a lot more squat volume than a, a lanky or taller lifter that has more things moving around. Um, so that's, that's part of this study. So for the quadricep, were they doing like a leg press, a leg extension? Uh, yeah, I believe both. Um, let me just look real quick if I have that. Um, those two for sure. And I think it was one of those studies. They didn't even do much for hamstrings. You don't get, I just actually talked to Brett about this. The hamstring involvement in a squat is very minimal. Um, there's less than I actually, you know, he sent me some studies and I'm like, wow, it's actually, I mean, I always knew the hamstrings weren't heavily stimulated in a squat. But it it was less than I had even that I had. I, I, I for whatever reason, and I'm six foot three, so maybe this is why. But I always notice my adductors get really thick when I squat a lot. That's one muscle that I'm not like, hey, excited for that to grow. But it does add some fullness to my legs. But I just noticed they got really dense on the inner the inner part of my thigh there. Yeah, so. and that's twenty five percent of your upper leg volume. You're at oh. so. Uh, that's a lot more like that's surprising to me. Yeah. So for people that want big legs to ignore the adductors is that's a mistake. I never I don't know if it's just the way the squat is positioned, but I never noticed them growing until I started doing free squats. And now I do more like dumbbell work, but I definitely always feel sore there from that. Um, so it does help with a complete leg. Uh, let me let me talk two things about the just the the frequency and, and and volume conundrum with 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 as we're programming for clients or even for ourselves and let's just use um I don't, I, let's let's use um shoulders as an example so if i'm going to do 12 sets per week and i have a shoulder day i'm going to look at this from two perspectives i'm um, actually let's use chest i'll use chest as my example so i'm going to do all 12 sets in one day i i live this by the time I get, so I'm probably going to do three exercises of, of four sets each or maybe four exercises of three sets each. So if I'm going to do all of my volume in one day, I'm trash by the end of the, like, the, the, the set six through 12, whatever exercise that is, it is not going to be with um, as much energy and motivation as my first exercise sure. that I started with. So there's the first issue. And an argument for spreading out that volume over three, maybe even four days per week. So that was one thing that I did like when I was doing body part training every day, like six days per week. It would be like one, one exercise of th basically three sets. But man, I was I was able to put a lot of energy into everything. Sure. So there's the first consideration, just what is your energy level when you're going to combine all of this stuff? And I would even say that's an argument against two days per week for a body part. But I know that's a very common split, um, like an upper, lower, upper, lower split. The other thing is, let's look at this physiologically. If let's assume that stimulating muscle protein synthesis in a given workout and in a given muscle is is the is is the um it's the stimulus that we need to grow muscle the question we have to ask then is okay i want to maximally stimulate the muscle in terms of muscle protein synthesis the first set will stimulate it x amount then the second maybe a little more the third a little bit more but we do know that as you keep adding sets the muscle protein synthesis response gets lower and lower and lower. So it's it's almost like you get the biggest bang for your buck in that very first working set. So if you're going to do 12 sets, 
how much extra benefit in terms of muscle protein synthesis stimulation are you getting on that muscle? I would suggest very little. And now you compound that with not only am I not getting much of an added benefit, I'm having to wait seven more days before I stimulate that muscle again. So I think intuitively, if you take a, a cellular uh, approach to this and you look at muscle protein synthesis, splitting up a muscle group over two, three, four days per week, where you're getting the largest increases in muscle protein synthesis from the first few sets makes more sense. And I would say, and here's what we don't have, we don't have data that has looked at this over a year. There are always eight weeks. This study that I'm that we're talking about was eight yeah. weeks, sometimes 12. I think there's an argument to be made if you have more frequent stimulation or uh, recruitment of a muscle in a given week, and that's extended over months and months and months, theoretically, you would have a better muscle hypertrophic response. Now, again, that's theoretical, Yeah. but it, make, it, it it's logical when you look at it from a muscle protein synthesis approach. Yeah, I think, so the two schools of thought for what I'm thinking about are the two different athletes I work with. If you're working with a physique athlete and you tell them to do one or maybe two chest exercises, they're going to be like, but I'm not hitting all my chest because of all the divisions. Right. So I think a lot of us focus on, okay, are we actually, especially, you know, the chest is semi-complicated, but the back is very complicated, right? Like different angles are required. So you really would struggle, I think, to hit all the back muscles in two different exercises and kind of be done. The other would be, um, a strength athlete who's performing a skill. And I certainly, when I was um, powerlifting, was doing three bench, three squat, sometimes two to three deadlift sessions per week. And I definitely noticed in those weeks, I got much more efficient at those movements, right? So, um, you know, you just, you just, they just become like cruise control. You get good technique, good form, and you're able to perform slightly better, partly because you're, you know, your, your, your body is just remembering those motions so smoothly. Right. So, um, you know, and this is something that bodybuilders struggle with too, you know, talking about form and technique, hitting all the muscles. So, um, you know, they, they picked kind of like body parts for this study that were single movement body parts, right. There's not a lot of different ways to train the quad. You extend the foot, right? Like that's, you know, same with the bicep and the tricep, you move the hand up and down, but with the chest, in the shoulders and the back, you're talking about multi angles and multi these things. So, um, that, that's, that's where I think you, you get, you know, I mean, how many times have you gone in the gym and done an upper chest, done a flat fly movement, a decline, you know, you're trying to hit all that chest. So, I mean, what would you, your thoughts be on that? Would you divide the workouts, maybe do an upper chest day and a lower chest day, or would you think it would be better to do kind of an all over chest each of those two or three times? I, I personally, and again, there, there are people that specialize more in bodybuilding programming, but I would try to hit each muscle group that, that I'm prioritizing each workout. So yeah. that would be then two chest exercises. And like you said, the back gets a little crazy because you're talking traps, rhomboids, lats, erectors, like it gets, that, that gets very yeah. dicey um, with the back, with the back. Um, but yeah, so I would choose, and that, and you're making a good point. A muscle will only grow if it's stimulated. Um, now it's also funny. I'm working on my the my January issue of Body by Science, and there there's a the study that I'm reviewing for January basically says if you try to change your workout up all the time, like from workout to workout, there's no benefit to that. Yeah. Um, there's also no harm. So. If people want to, you know, manipulate their reps or manipulate their rest periods, there's no harm. But um, I, I do think some people program hop way too quickly, and I think that limits their progress. Um, I, uh, I I like the idea of sticking with a, a, a core program for probably four to six week blocks and then changing up your program. Yep. And I change up my my rep ranges. Um quite often actually like I, I get bored if I don't do that yeah I'll but just I, change the, changing the order even sometimes is all I need to do I'll keep I'll use the same exercises but instead of doing preacher curl last I'll start with the preacher curl on a back day 
And I'm like, wow, I didn't realize how weak my biceps were by the end of a back workout, right? So you yes, you can just kind of change things like minimally. And technically on paper, it wouldn't look like much difference, but that that keeps you excited, um, you know, but I'm like you, I, I've been using, I mean, I'm training for 30 years now. That's a scary number. I'm still using the same movements that felt good 30 years ago. Now, you know, I might find a new machine that's got a new kind of, you know, angle or something that I really like, but you know, I, you know, outside of the barbell hip thrust, I don't think there's been an, a, a, an exercise invented <laughs> that I, you know, that's new in the last few years. No, not, not that I'm aware of. And so let me, let me just take us back to our, the, the, to the consensus in the, in the evidence-based space. Yeah. Training a muscle group one day per week is not ideal. It's something greater than that. So right. that's going to be anywhere from two to six days per week. Um, when I used to work with clients, I would, now a lot, my clients were not like yours where their job was to train. So these were professionals that, you know, they worked a job. So I would often just, I would plan their workouts around their lifestyle. I'm like, okay, how many days can you lift? And I would backtrack my programming into what fit their lifestyle so that they would be able to most easily adhere to the program that we created. And it was a team yeah. effort. Yeah. So, you know, I'll, I'll give you like, I'd like to hear what the expert on that article kind of suggested, because I do both. I do, I have some clients training two times a week and some training three. Now, the difference being the clients that I have training two days a week, they're more trying to grow their entire body, right? Now for specific divisions in the bodybuilding world, um, you may be trying to focus. And, and what Brett and I have come up with is like, you can basically focus on one upper and one lower body part per four to six week block that you can train three days a week. But if you try to chain chest and shoulders and arms and glutes and quads and hamstrings three days a week each, you're not going to be able to recover from that volume. It's going to be too much. But what, what I do with most of my bikini competitors is I have them training glutes and shoulders three days a week back and other body parts two days a week their recovery is great they feel great every workout um, and we're able to make progress on those two body parts while at least maintaining everything else and so this this has allowed us to make some progress so it gets a little bit more nuanced when you get to yeah. high level physique competitors i mean for the average person i think full body workouts a couple of days a week is really all you need but um you know i think our audience here is looking for okay how can i optimize my current training so you would you would agree with if you're training your body parts once a week, try two. If you've been doing two, maybe try three on a couple body parts, spacing that out over different days. You got to get creative with the programming because I've never written programs before Brett where I had someone do just glutes and shoulders on the same day. But it was essential for them to get those body parts trained uh, over the course of the week three times each. There was really no other way to do it. Um unless I wanted them in the gym six or seven days a week. And I try to keep them in the gym five days a week. So who was the expert on this? I'd love to hear what, what they did with this article. Oh, um, Mike Matthews. Oh, um, Mike. Okay. Muscle for life. Yeah. 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 And I gotta, I gotta refresh myself on, I think, and I was, um, my other expert here was um, Haley Babcock. I asked her to specifically take this from a beginner approach Um so not relevant to your audience. And what did Mike say? Um, basically the same things that we're saying. Prioritize what's important to you. So if you just like what you're saying and what I appreciate what you said, uh, we always hear this 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 term sports specific training. And usually yeah. we're thinking of soccer, baseball, where you're training specific to the sport. Well, your athletes, they're elite level bodybuilders, physique athletes. So you're training them specific to how they're going to be judged on stage. Yeah. So he made that point, prioritize a muscle group and, and then kind of what you just mentioned that you and Brett do with shoulders, glutes, and then, you know, work your volume in days per week on lifestyle, flexibility, all of, all of that stuff. So that, that was kind of his approach. Um, he also said something that we didn't talk about. Well, we, we kind of touched on it. Um, you can say that you do X amount of volume, but again, if your intensity is just horrible when you're doing that and you're just not engaged, you know, if your workout's approaching two hours, 
two and a half hours. Um, yeah. What, what is that looking like in the last third of that workout? No, so again, I, mm -mm. I'm, I'm uh, if I can't get you in and out of the gym in an hour, that's too much. Right. Um, maybe on some lower body days where we're training a little heavier and you need a little rest between sets, it could go a little longer, but for the most part, you know, I, I want to keep it under an hour, keep you fresh. And, um, you know, cause there's other, there's other things we're doing. We're not training for the Olympics here. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. So I'm sure Michael so, Phelps, you know, has some cranny, you know, during the Olympic training, he's in the pool for 12 hours, 10 hours, yeah, whatever, whatever it was for, for a short period of time. And he can, he can do that because he is Michael Phelps, but you know, physique athletes have jobs, their moms, you know, so it's gotta be reasonable. Yep. And the other thing he said, which is kind of like my other expert, beginners one to two days per week, More the more advanced you get, the more that you're probably going to increase your volume and you're going to be forced to have an elevated frequency to accommodate that volume. So yeah, uh, yeah. The most, know. the most advanced people that I've trained with, and I would put like um, Lane Norton in there, I'd put Doug Miller in there. Um, you know, my buddy, Ron Parmer, the guys that have been training for 20 plus years at incredibly high intensities that are incredibly strong, their training volume for them to make progress is so high that they have to train very, a very high volume per session. And then as soon as they can repeat that body part, they do that. Um, you know, so, you know, and especially Lane now he's focused on powerlifting a lot, but when when you train with people at that caliber, you know, you might see something on the internet, but trust me, when you get in a gym with them and get in a setting with them, when that set starts, they are mentally at war with that weight until the set is over. It's there's no talking, there's no looking around. It's go do your set, get ready for your next set. And it's, it's just a different mentality. It's not a social thing. Um, and seeing that and training that the next time you train, you know, you get mentally prepared for a set differently. So I think, you know, when we're talking about studies on working out and, you know, there's, you know, there's probably in these studies, there's people in the room writing things down. And I did a study for you guys at USF um, where they looked at my leg strength before and after contest prep. I don't know if you remember yep. that. Yeah. Our K series study. Yep. So they did a leg extension before prep and then after prep to, or I think it was maybe at the maybe three times, maybe before prep at the end of prep and then at a follow-up. Yeah. I think another but eight months later, I think that's they right. were actually yelling at me. Let's go lock it out. You can do two more. Let's go all the way. Lock, you know, and I found like, man, I like set a PR on leg extensions <laughs> because I had the lab people there and I'm like, okay, so this is why studies can be different because if you just tell someone to go do a couple reps there and just see what they do, I probably would have got half the reps with half the weight. But because I knew in my mind they were going to be there yelling at me for those training weeks, I was like, I got to be prepared for when we go back for this follow up. I don't want to look like a little bitch in there. Right. So um, <laughs> there's there's so much nuance to training um, that, you know, you can two people can look at something and get completely different results just based on their focus and intensity in the gym um, and learning yeah. how to flip that switch. So that I don't know. That would be interesting. Has there ever been a study where they just did a softly guided program and a, you know, like almost like a military, like someone pushing you like a personal trainer would or a really good coach would in the gym? I, that that would be interesting to me because, you know, it did, did, did change my physique forever when I started training with people of that caliber. You know, like I thought I trained hard and then I went and did squats with Lane. I'm like, what the hell? This guy, like, <laughs> I thought he was going to fail his first rep and he did 10, right? Whereas like the first time I hit a sticking point, the set's over. He's like, no, 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 you got five more. I was like, what? You know, like, so you <laughs> learned to, to go through these barriers a little bit. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, the, the thing with when you're measuring strength or strength endurance, researchers will typically, yeah, they, they want to have maximal exertion. So that's why you have the yelling, the encouraging. Yeah. Um, for these muscle hypertrophy studies, we're not, it's, I don't think anybody would ever do that for the entire workout. Yeah. Um, it's just, yes. And what we've done better as a, in the research profession 
is we make people train close to failure now. And that yeah. is now, you know, that's standardized. Um, years ago, you wouldn't do that. And the, the results you, were much harder to predict because some people would push it further than others. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing with, with training. There's so much nuance to it. It's not just like, Oh, is this program better than this? And it's, it might be for some people and not for others. I mean, I, I've also seen some athletes have just incredible ability to recover um, from a training session. Whereas, you know, some athletes, it'll take them a couple more days. Right. So there is, there is a genetic component to building muscle. That's, you know, I always think about it like dog breeds, right? A poodle and a pit bull are both dogs, but in the dog world, the poodle must think the pit bulls on steroids. <laughs> he must look at that dog and go, how are we the same? Right. And it's the same with people. There's some people you just see them and you go, how, how is that? How am I the same species as that? There's just, they just, their muscles are bigger or bubblier. And um, so, and you know, I'm, I'm sure all it takes is one or two people to get in a study like this to just completely throw off the, you know, if you got a genetically elite person that hasn't really trained a whole lot, start training them twice a week you might see something crazy yeah well that that's where you hope that your randomization covers that and if you have enough subjects that it would be somewhat muted so but yeah if you only have a few subjects in a study you're much more susceptible to outliers influencing the 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 results yeah so i kind of feel like the um the answer lies in okay it's not once a week it's two or three times a week. And then it becomes specific to what this individual has time for, what their focus is and what their needs are. Um, Cause like- And their like natural recovery you. ability as well. Like how do they recover? Yeah, and no, actually that's that's another interesting topic. And I don't know if you guys are doing any of your review on that, but um, some of my clients have started wearing aura rings, um, mm -hmm. measure, measuring their heart rate variability. Um, you know, their body temperature, their resting heart rate, which are all, you know, you know, you can use those to kind of divulge if someone is overtrained or, you know, fatigued. Um, so some of those scores have been helpful. Um, have you, have you guys done, is there any research in that stuff yet? The none of none from my own personal lab, the, the limited research that I'm aware of doesn't give a lot of validity to that, to the data that it's giving. Um, but I, but knowing, uh, admittedly, I'm not an expert in that. Yeah. I just would, um, I guess I, I would phrase it. Here's how it's been explained to me by somebody who has done some work in those areas. You get up in the morning and you look at your data from whatever device you're using. And it says, you're going to have a crappy day. So now you do. Whereas when they blind it and you don't know what your data was, you might've had a great workout because you didn't know that you were supposed to have a crappy day. So it's, sure. yeah, you do have to be careful about, you know, the self-fulfilling prophecy. So you're of, you're and, saying the aura ring can become like a horoscope. Yeah. And I'm not, I don't want to call out the aura ring. I'm saying a lot of the heart rate variability devices sure. that base recovery on that measure, they are at least at this point in time, a little lacking in validity. So yeah. Again, tr revolving your training life around that data, you you could be shortchanging yourself or Yeah, so I'll be honest, I don't I've never worn one, I haven't, and my training variability from day to day and this is what I advise my clients to do is when you get in the gym and start moving, if it feels good, hey, good day to push it, right? And if you get in Absolutely. there and you you pick up a 10 pound dumbbell and it feels like 45 pounds, today's probably a good day to go a little lighter, a little more time under tension, you know, um, and not focus so much on, on pushing heavier weights. And that's kind of the motto that I've used is almost like a self regulated auto regulation, you know, model. That's exactly um, what it is. And I would, I do something similar. If you feel like you're going to kill it, that's where you take every set maybe to one rep shy of failure. Yeah. And if, like you said, if it's just, you're not feeling it, well then sh stop about three reps shy of failure. It's a big difference yeah. in, but you're still getting the same mechanical tension. You're still getting approximately yeah. the same stimulus, but getting those extra reps at the end have a big impact on your recovery ability. Um, even your cellular energy disruption by doing one set to closer to failure than two or three is a big difference. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that's, that's one of the things that's hard to Im impair on an athlete that you're coaching is like, it's not a successful workout just because you're 
drenched in sweat and you can't move afterwards. You know, I think that's sometimes the the moniker of the person that goes to the gym for an hour is like, I just have to go all out for an hour every day. And, you know, that's not necessarily the best way to make progress. Um, but I feel like they like to punish, <laughs> you know, it's just, um, yeah. and, and that's just one other thing. It's, it's happened to me and it happens to most people that I know you feel like crap and you go into your workout and it is, and it ends up being like an amazing workout. It's, it's, it's weird. So yeah, someday- I've, I've, I've talked about that a few times, how I'll get to the gym and find out that it's a weird day and they're closing in 30 minutes. And I'm like, man, I only got 30 minutes. All right. I guess I'll just do something completely different. And it's amazing. And I'm like, man, that was a great 30 minutes. Cause I knew I only had 30 minutes versus when I go in the gym in the middle of the day and I got all the time in the world. And I'm just kind of lollygagging sometimes. So yeah, just changing one of those little variables can be great. Um, awesome. So Let's um let's plan to reconvene maybe in another month, another episode, yep. another issues coming out. And, I'll send uh, you the December issue. I can tell you now it's going to be on glutes and it's going to be a full squat versus half squat. So there was a pretty famous study. Um, which one would develop? Is there a difference in developing glute hypertrophy? Okay. And then the other one was on sleep deprivation and body fat gain, particularly abdominal fat. So does... So- when you say half squat, um, there's two ways to do a half squat. Is it all the way to the bottom and then halfway up or is it halfway down? Oh, halfway down. So a 90 okay. degree ish versus ass to the grass. Um, all the, you know. Yeah. That, the- I mean, just off the top of my head, I feel like stopping at 90 degrees keeps a lot of the focus on the quads, but no, I'd be interested. Yeah. Well, I'll show you this. I'll show you the study. And what's funny about that. I had my opinion. And then Brett, as the expert, had a different take on it. So, okay. <laughs> and who am I to argue? With, who am I to argue with him? Right. I mean, that guy's looked at training glutes six ways from Sunday. He's just still coming up with ideas. Every now and then, I go on his Instagram. I'm like, oh, that's a great idea, you know. And he's always trying to give people credit that you know, because he's like, I don't know if I invented this, but I've never seen anyone do it. So let me know if you've seen someone do it. Um, so. He's uh, he's just always got his eyes and ears open in the gym, creating equipment. Um, yeah, yeah, he's he's a he's a modern day like fitness inventor. So, yeah, and he 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 earns that. I mean, you don't think of the invention ideas unless you're in the trenches, thinking, yeah. oh wow, this is what we need. Like that's that's what I appreciate about him. Yeah, yeah, no, and that's I mean that's why you know Brett's a grinder. Like he's still. You call him today, he's in the gym with somebody testing out a new piece of equipment or, you know, trying to help somebody set a PR. Um, We're actually going to be training in his garage when we go out um, for the Olympia. We'll just be away from everybody. We'll have the competitors there. So it won't be so like hectic. Um, So, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to see what he has to to say in your article. So if you guys are if you guys are interested in coaching and learning about this stuff, I mean, these are the, you know, Bill and 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 Lane and. you know, obviously Brett and Mike Zoros, these are the people that kind of formed my early career. They were, you know, we were going to these seminars and you guys were doing all your presentations. Um, and now we got the, you know, now we've got your body by science issues coming out every month that are just, you know, and I like that it's two and it's not overwhelming. Um, and I love that you have somebody, it's not just you talking about the research, it's you talking to somebody that's doing the work in the field as well, going, well, you've seen this research, what are your thoughts on it? How would you apply it? Or how maybe you don't apply it. Maybe the research is crap compared to what you've seen anecdotally. Right. And that's, that's, that's just as important though. Cause not every research finding has practical relevance. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, how many people actually go through the trouble of reading the research to see how the study was done? Because sometimes you start reading through it and you go, that, that doesn't sound like it would work at all. Why would they do it that way? Right. So um, I mean, there's, there's limitations in research. There's not limitations in anecdote, right? So, um, you got to get this research approved by a review board and, you know, sometimes it's, you know, well, I don't have to tell you, but you know, I, I saw Lauren going through the struggles of getting her, um, study done when she was in school and it's just not, you know, everyone wants there to be a bunch of research, but it's not easy to, to do research. No, <laughs> not at all. Yeah. <laughs> So that's why I don't do research. That's why I leave it up to Brad Schoenfeld. That guy does like four studies a day, I feel like. <laughs> well, he's the 
he's the Brett of of the research world. It's, he just loves research. Yeah, but so. a lot of your a lot of your listeners don't know this. You have you have supported my research financially in the past, and hopefully again in the future. I'll ask you again in the future. So yes, you're not in the lab, but your hard work has contributed to what we found. So you mentioned earlier that case series study in bodybuilders. What happens after the show? Yeah, you helped fund some of that. So thank you. And again, yeah, no, and I want to continue doing that. And I, I intend. I don't know if it'll ever happen, but I've just, I've seen. I think you and I have talked about. It. I've seen and done some things with my clients that I just know to be true. There's not a lot of research in it, but I know it to be true that these are, like for me, indisputable. The best ways to approach certain situations, and you know, it's just not researchable. Almost right. You, you're just not going to get a bunch of athletes that are contest lean um no. to 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 follow your advice unless you're their coach so i almost like incubate my own research amongst my competitors that i just see you know evidence happening over and over of things um so you know i love the idea of research but i don't love it as much as i love coaching so it's like i'm not going to pull back my coaching to do these things so um i'm grateful for the research that is that is being done and i think that can wrap it up for today all right. Yeah. Looking forward to um, next month. Well, you tell me if you want to talk about glutes or sleep or maybe both. Maybe we can split. You know, it. based yeah. on my audience, I'm going to probably tell you it's going to be glutes <laughs> <laughs> and my uh, interests because you got me. You got my interest peaked. So I'm excited to read this one. Yes. All right. And I'll be out with Brett in about two weeks at his house so we can talk about it then. Perfect. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Bill. Thank right. you guys Thank you. For, uh, for listening to the Pro Physique Code.